Ibrahim, I'm super excited to be talking to you today. And one of the themes that came up, you know, Lou Gerstner wrote a book a number of years ago called Something to the Effect of Can Elephants Dance? And, and that's what came to mind when I was thinking about our conversation to a certain extent, because you've been part of the transformation revolution really early on. I mean, before it was even mainstream with some of the biggest companies in the world, many of them very traditional companies. So it's been, it's been a, you know, being a pioneer and kind of a digital revolutionary, right? In, in, in learning how to drive change, enroll people in a vision, execute on it, sustain it. So I'm just gonna jump right in. Why don't we just start with GE? I mean, let's just start there because I know Jeff Immelt was driving a lot of change early on. How did you end up at GE? And let's just talk about some of those pioneering days in digital transformation. Absolutely, Ruben. Thanks so much for having me uh, on this, and, and I, I look forward to the conversation. And as you, said, as you said, I mean, GE has always been a very exciting company. Uh, from the uh, days of its foundation, always at the forefront of innovation, always uh, you know, acquiring companies, becoming a major conglomerate with different businesses, different business models. And I joined GE actually right after my PhD on AI. Mm -hmm. to drive some of these analytics and data initiatives across multiple of our businesses. And a lot of the work we did actually was extremely pioneering. You know, we were one of the first companies who really started using analytics and data for its financial services or GE Capital for lead generation, for competitive intelligence, for asset management, even before big data was a thing. And even before unstructured data was a thing, we were at the research center building new services, new applications that were leveraging all those advanced technologies. And uh, then when you do that for one business unit, actually there's a lot of applicability for another business unit, like for media. How do you figure out how the social networks proliferate and how do they grow? And can you use that as a, as a mechanism to understand the success of your new movies, for instance? Can you look at the social network and media buzz, and then use that as a mechanism to drive growth in other parts of your uh, media. Right. Business. So it's a super interesting growth lab, right? I mean, and, and, it, and the big data, you know, and yeah. no one knew in 2008, we were already at the Beijing Olympics. We had to deal with lots of data from our digital properties to be able to serve our advertisers. And then once you do that, then you can apply that to infrastructure. We applied the technology that we developed for media directly into the uh, infrastructure and smart grid business to prevent blackouts. So, you know, it was very exciting times, lots of potential for big data analytics. And I led a lot of those initiatives back at the research center. And then um, over time, of course, due to these internal capabilities, GE started thinking, you know, can we also start to transform to become a software company? Right. And can we build a viable software business that is focused on industrial applications like in aviation, in transportation, in healthcare, in energy. And can we use these data capabilities to understand better the condition of our assets, the uh, optimization of the operations? And can we bring productivity, efficiency, reliability to our customers who are you know, like really large oil and gas energy customers? So this one we built uh, GE Digital. And even though you know, there have been mixed opinions of what it was and what it became, I think it was a true pioneer in creating a market category that now has become massive. And almost every large enterprise software company, every large industrial company is following that uh, kind of playbook to bring the same benefits that I mentioned, productivity, availability, and using the data that is generated by those assets to be able to create significant outcomes for, for their customers. So for sure, you know, uh, it, it, it has been a long time in, in the development phase. And then we were able to commercialize a lot of that for our customers and created really a new market that nobody knew existed at the time. Which, which is pros and cons, right? I read Jeff Emil's book, Hot Seat, where he talks about pushing this. And there was some resistance though internally as well, right? I mean, there was some skepticism and resistance. How did you deal with that? Because you were kind of tip of the spear and your data had to be right, right? I mean, you couldn't afford uh, yeah. Of course, there's some uncertainty when you're building something new, uh, yeah. clearly, you know, you certainly have some ambitions, you have to have a vision, and you also have to have an executable roadmap, because the vision by itself really may be entirely wrong or may not be executable. So we thought, you know, we had both, and we had a clear roadmap on how to progress in this new market category, and we thought we had some ideas on the investment required. 
But of course, you know, you can never control how the rest of the world evolves and transforms. And nobody would have, nobody could have imagined what AWS and Azure would become and right. how successful right. they would be. You know, this is, we're talking about the beginnings of AWS as we were thinking about these concepts and or the other enterprise software companies. So it's hard to control the competition, hard to control the market, and uh, certain things are out of your control. So, you know, it, it was an amazing ambition. And uh, I think, you know, we had a great vision and an executable roadmap and we did execute that partially. But of course, you know, it, it didn't succeed as much as we hoped because the the rest of the world moved really fast and, uh, you know, we're, we're, able, we're in a better position uh, later that, that to execute that vision. And speaking of moving fast, you're at GE, you're one of the most respected brands in the world, right? You stepped up in a big way after a PhD program. You've got a very deep, you know, uh, academic and now uh, uh, real world experience to, to draw from. And I love the fact that you could go into everything from NBC all the way to GE oil and gas. I mean, it's an, in that sense, it's an amazing conglomerate. Um, but then a new opportunity came calling. You had the opportunity to go to Maersk, one of the world's oldest shipping companies, largest shipping companies. I think you told me, what, 20% of global trade somehow yeah. touches Maersk, right? They, 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 you know, that's for one company is incredible. What drew you to Maersk yeah. and what happened there? Because talk about an old old school um, Scandinavian uh, shipping company, right? And, and first of all, very bold of them to invite you in and, and have a vision for something new. Absolutely. So I, I think, you know, clearly Maersk, yes, one of the um, sort of historical shipping and transportation companies, and, but they were always a pioneer in what they do and mm. the industry followed their lead. So they innovated a lot of industry first over the life of the conglomerate even. You know, the, the moment they started in shipping with a couple of ships and then the way they expanded to oil and gas and air cargo and yeah. other, they even had a data business that they ended up selling to IBM. So Maersk was always a pioneer in, in shipping and transportation. And, uh, but at the time, uh, I joined, both the industry was struggling with customer experience and the mm -hmm. proliferation of data, but also uh, there was a bit of a uh, you know, period where things stalled from an IT perspective, because most companies started outsourcing their IT capabilities to other companies, and they kind of lost the core competencies internally in the middle of a period where you have to really transform uh, your uh, company in a, in a digitally. So, you, right. you need to really digitally transform to meet the customer and market expectations. But at the same time, you kind of eliminated some of those core competencies because of the outsourcing wave that happened in the 90s and, and 2000s. And so th what really excited me about Maersk is the reputation and the, uh, the, the culture. It's a very strong, very innovative culture. And also the problem that, you know, as you said, 20% of global trade goes through its operations and the massive yeah. amount of data, whether on the ocean operations, in logistics, and the ability, at the time I joined, we were also going through a major business transformation from a port-to-port -port ocean shipping company into an end-to-end -end integrator of container logistics, which really, again, was unheard of. You know, in most cases, these uh, container lines stay in port-to-port. -port. There are freight forwarders that do the end-to-end, and they had this customer relationship. And so nobody thought, you know, a, a, an ocean shipping company can expand into this end-to-end -end integrated role. And that also required a lot of digitization of internal systems, you know, creating these modern architectures, democratizing data and AI so that we can build better products and services, like pricing engines. Uh, we can build new businesses that solve some of the key supply chain challenges. Yeah. So, you know, and then there was a very uh, supportive leadership and board led by some very um, senior and world-renowned software executives. And so I, knowing that, you know, the senior leadership was hugely supportive, the board was supportive, the problem was big, and there was an opportunity to make a big difference at that point of the transformation was really exciting to me. And I mean, since then, the company has made so much progress and uh, my, my successor or people who took over after I left really even made it bigger and a lot more scale. So it's a very exciting no, story, I think, to find. And I love that. Let's talk a little bit about this. I want to talk, talk, touch base on two things. Number one, you came in as an outsider, which means, and forgive me if I'm wrong, 
you didn't necessarily have a lot of relationships in the company. You didn't have relationship capital. Okay, you had success at GE. That does give you some, some credibility, right? For sure. You got the job you're in. How do you... Uh, build uh, relationship capital fast, right? How do you how do you enroll business and build relationship capital fast? And number two, um, how do you develop early wins so people can see some momentum? And the reason I'm asking this in part, obviously part of your story, but also a lot of people right now are looking for jobs throughout there or, or yeah. they're moving. Any any practical tips and tricks that help you kind of establish a, a beachhead and expand upon it within Maersk very quickly? Yeah, so I think the, um, the the first thing I tried to do was obviously to uh, change the operating model of the company when it comes to building new products and services, when it comes to operationalizing AI. Were they and, open to that? Uh, yeah, to do that, I mean, you have to really think in baby steps. Yeah. And the first thing is there's always this uh, thinking in large companies that, you know, things have been done the same way for decades. And are not going to change because you know we don't change fast. That's the perception in the lower level employees. Even though the management is driving lots of change in in the rest of the organization, sometimes the thinking is you know we don't change. Things are always the same. So uh, the first thing that I started pushing is really this idea of design thinking. You know how do you really uh, create an environment where people can go out of this corporate desk environment and in, into more of a collaborative environment where they can. Uh, start from like the concepts of MVP and uh, you know failing fast. That design thinking and lean startup ideas in a small setting. How do you start showing that things are changing? Because this is something that the company has never done, and there was never a design center in the company, and now right. it's a small design center, and that was kind of a symbol of change. And then people started believing, okay, you know, th this is serious now. And then the second is you really have to engage a, a broader part of the organization, especially who the, the people who have been in the company for a while and, and yeah. pick some of them and make them ambassadors of the change. Because it's so much easier if an existing mask leader demonstrates that they can personally change and they can adapt to this new operating model versus somebody who's perceived to be coming from Silicon Valley <clears throat> and uh, with a with a uh, background on software and uh, digital, so it's it's very important that you show okay some people who they have been friends with and they worked for yeah. now they are leveraging this transformation to succeed. Yeah. Therefore, everybody else can succeed, right? So this concept of involving the rest of the organization, you can call it leading from behind, you can call it you know servant leadership. There are so many ways to do that, but it's all about, it's not about your success as the digital leader. It's about everybody else's success. Okay. And Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. I and mean, the moment people recognize that, then you're not anymore a threat, but you're an enabler and you're a resource. And then uh, people start to open up. Was there a moment when you realized the organization is getting it? Meaning you got an email from somebody, or maybe you bumped into somebody in the lunch crowd and they said, hey, I... They gave you some feedback that that kind of was a eureka moment for you that hey this is really beginning to take hold was were, were there were there a few defining moments like that absolutely i mean you start to see that uh we are uh the people who were in the sidelines started to actively support you and the people who were in a wait and see mode are actively taking ownership of yeah. some of the joint collaborative work so the, the moment you realize that and then they become the spokespeople of these uh, work, uh, and not you. You know, you're not anymore communicating of the accomplishments, but somebody else is communicating to the organization. So that I think is a tipping point for any external leader that that you're getting acceptance and you're getting positive feedback from the rest of the leadership and then the board, and and they are supportive of your work. So those were the really uh, tipping points and the moments that uh, anybody you know you can realize things are changing and. So people are taking ownership. So your tour, you had success at Maersk, your success at GE, your tour of the world's largest conglomerates continued, right? You, uh, yeah. You, yeah. Decide, you, you like to play with big companies, lots of moving pieces, right? Thousands of organizations. And there was a really interesting opportunity that came with Schneider. Yeah. They came so looking. Saw, yeah. So what I saw with Maersk also was that we had uh, a, a very good friend of mine, a great colleague, the CIO, and myself, we really worked in close collaboration 
and he was more in charge of digitizing the the the, in, the, the backend, which was yeah. extremely important. And I was more in charge of building these next generation data enabled AI enabled products and services. But then uh, there was a bit of a tension, not between us, but the way people perceive these two organizations. You yeah. know, perceive okay, there's an IT leader, there's a digital leader. Who does what? And how do we make sure the budget is spent properly? And then how do we make sure they are not duplicating each other or duplicating the tech stack? And what I realized was uh, this more a unified approach would be so much more effective. And the Schneider Electric opportunity was exactly that. So this was the CTO of the mm -hmm. digital function, yeah. Yeah. Uh, chief digital officer, right. really veteran, successful uh, internal leader for many, many years. And he was in charge of both IT and digital. And the uh, responsibility of the role was to really both uh, architect across IT and digital, but also kind of drive the operating model transformation. How do we become you know, less of a project company, but more of a product company with the, the key skills like product ownership? Uh, you know, how do you build a roadmap, the product vision? Even if they are internal applications, Right. It's important to set the basics and the culture right so that they are developed so that, you know, you can do integrated planning, you can do dependency management, you can reduce escalations, you can move stuff past the market and, and therefore uh, uh, please the customers more. So that was a very interesting job because it combines both elements of a digital transformation, both the digitization and the digital transformation and allowed me to have a much... Uh, bigger look and a very uh, storied company again. I, I, I have known them for many years, going to GE where we had competing businesses, but Schneider is the leader, global leader in energy management, industrial automation, amazing partnership network, uh, very focused ambitions on, on digital transformation and digitizing their customers' operations. And so it's you know, a very exciting opportunity and that's why uh, kind of, I, I was uh, you know, excited to join Schneider at that point of their time. A hundred percent. But then life kind of threw all of us a curveball, right? Like you came in ready to go. You had your plans. You probably had a vision. You had, you know, this. And then we had a global pandemic. So very interesting juxtaposition of, because I guess the global pandemic in many ways was a, a, a transformation, right? I mean, it was a disruption. So so how did that factor in to what you were trying yeah. to do? So I mean, obviously transformations are what you're doing, trying to do takes time and uh, changing the organization to focus on the objectives and bringing in some selective external talents to be able to bridge the skill set gaps, but also investing in internal talents right. so that they're also driving this transformation, as I said earlier, because you cannot just do this with external people. You know, you have to really use all the positive internal knowledge to be able to do it. And, as we were doing that, as you said, you know, in at the beginning of 2020, uh, obviously, uh, and Schneider is a global company, even though the US faced COVID in March, uh, we were already facing in January because yeah. China obviously right. started in January. So about a year into the role that I had, clearly we had to dramatically shift our focus on first protecting our employees mm -hmm. that, you know, they couldn't go to the office. There was a clear risk of health crisis for everyone. And so protecting our employees, protecting our customers, and how do we prepare as a company better for, it, for an uncertain future? You know, things slowed down, yeah. people couldn't visit offices or facilities anymore, and the budgets started getting uh, cut across the globe right. for every company. And then our focus as a leadership team really shifted to, okay, how do we really respond to this uh, protecting employees, protecting customers? And, you know, uh, even as basic as, like our CIO did a great job. How do you make sure people can do video conferences on our network that yeah. required a massively uh, bigger capability? Or VPN, you know, people needed to be on VPN all the time. And how do you change the network? So there were some very clear tactical things, but also how do we build a strategy so that we can not only survive, but also thrive? Because history has showed us in these moments of crisis, whoever can really enhance and expand their customer relationships, right. have better conversations, because that was a unique opportunity that suddenly, you know, if, if our CEO wanted to meet another CEO, they had to spend like two days traveling, you know, uh, to meet in person, but suddenly our CEO could have met six 
CEOs of customers right. the same way, to talk about, you know, how do we work together better? Yeah. So that was, I think, a, a unique opportunity for companies like Schneider who were already strong to get even stronger. And uh, so that was a very uh, interesting shift. And essentially all 2020 went to that kind of planning and less on uh, kind of the, what we envisioned in 2019. I completely understand. So there was some there was some hardships, but also some unexpected blessings, is what I'm hearing you say, right? In, in, in yeah. thinking of things new and creating some new opportunities. You then decided to go to a much smaller company. You left the big conglomerate space, right? Yeah. And that was a courageous decision. What what factored into because you could have been in the big conglomerate space for many years to come. I mean, you've a lot of success, a lot of impact, a lot of relationships, proven track record. This is kind of interesting. What what was the itch that I, th I think things things converged. You know, uh, there were there was a recognition that maybe the the roles have to change within a company like Schneider, and that maybe the organization has to change as well. So that was that recognition that uh, uh, maybe you know the the, the, the lo locations have to be different. Uh, you know, the people where they are and where they are sitting, and then also I always said this. Um, kind of thinking that even going back to my GE years where I was at some point leading the startup ecosystem and business yeah. development for smaller companies, I wanted to really uh, make an impact to scale up smaller companies because uh, my hypothesis was that uh, they need people with my operator experience and yeah. with the relationships I had in the industry. And I thought I could make a much bigger impact uh, scaling up those smaller companies versus um, you know, uh, staying in those corporate roles. And it was a great time, you know, right in 2021, we were about to get out of COVID and there was lots of funding. As we know, there was a huge bull market yeah. that there was lots of growth. And that's why I decided, you know, why don't I kind of take this opportunity and use uh, my skills to be able to uh, impact these smaller companies as an interim executive, pretty much, you know, how, how can I go and, maybe help them go from the current state into the next state yeah. and then, then learn what it takes. Because, you know, I, I never had problems with cash in larger companies. There's a budget, right. but the company never ran out of cash. And in smaller companies, you always have to think of, you know, even if the, the product may be amazing, the, the customers may be really happy, but you are going through the cycles of, you know, how do you fund the company and how do you, um, how do you create the cash flow? So it was a very unique challenge. And then, of course, every meeting you have in a smaller company is a customer meeting. You know, you can argue more than half of the meeting sometimes in a functional role in a large company is internal meetings because right. you have to align leaders and you have to align the company. And there's lots of reviews, business reviews, performance reviews. <clears throat> Whereas in a smaller company, you know, you don't have a large organization. And you have to just engage customers and every meeting is a customer meeting. So that was very exciting to really be always customer centric, outward looking. And at the same time, of course, I got uh, interest to be on public and private boards. Right. I uh, became a board member and another different, another skill set that uh, from, of course, as an executive, I worked with boards before, but now becoming a board member, both of public and private companies, that was pretty unique to see another perspective of the oversight responsibility, the risk and strategy and culture and the CEO succession kind of elements of the board role. And so combining these two, uh, scaling up startups or scale ups and the board roles was a unique combination of new skills that I had to build and which was an amazing learning experience, which has been an amazing learning experience. No, I get that. I get that. I mean, it, it's amazing where life can take us and it sounds like you, you, I keep, you keep adding to your portfolio of knowledge and expertise. Let's put on your prophetic hat for a second. Let's look into 2023, 2024. Just give me your top three to five predictions. What are you seeing based on what you experienced? What do you think will happen? And let's see if we can leave folks with some some final words of wisdom and insights that they might be able to uh, capitalize on as they plan for the next couple of years. Yeah. So I think I mean there is a um, obviously massive change again for for large corporations now in my board member role. I can see that the the issues we are facing are so much more than maybe five years ago. You know we have to have very strong viewpoints on ESG. You know, what's the right ESG strategy for a company? What's the right sustainability objectives? Balancing that with the shareholder value. And now we see a lot of mixed opinions on, 
you know, ESG ratings and ESG investments. And, but, you know, that doesn't mean we should actually slow down, but it means we should be razor sharp focused on creating the best value for a large number of stakeholders. And then similarly with diversity and inclusion. You know, while we may have diversified our boards and management teams a lot more than before, there's still a lot of room to grow in maybe looking at other underserved populations, as well as the granularity of these uh, kind of diverse populations. And are they all getting the same uh, kind of opportunities? Not only just women, but how about women of color? <clears throat> and the same thing with the inclusion aspects. You know, yes, they, we have now a lot of uh, female executives, for instance, but are they included in all the discussions and in all the decisions? You know, so this inclusion aspect, and then the whole, you know, the uh, activist investors and um, you know the, the expectations from a CEO. So there is a lot of uh, new issues that corporations have to deal with. I mean, the, the Ukraine war and other geopolitical developments. So it's a very exciting time, I think, for start, for large corporations, and they're already. They have undergone multiple iterations of digital transformation. So it's time now to again focus and uh, exploit what already works and then double down and scale it up, right? So there's very exciting time, I think, for large corporations. For the smaller companies, again, the bullish years, the bull run is over. The valuations are down and uh, you know, it's not easy to find capital as much as before, even though there's a lot of capital. You know, people are looking for runway and profitability, obviously, as right. we all know. And but again, you know, for companies that are really that have a good business model, that are really solving a big problem with the right team, and uh, kind of know what what they are doing, I think there's a huge opportunity to use this kind of a bit down period to build the the new businesses, the next unicorns, and the bigger businesses of the future. Because again, history shows us. All the a lot of large companies of today were built in recession or mm -hmm. in, in the crisis times. So uh, I, I see that you know this focus on uh, you know and the, the proliferation of AI obviously is amazing. I mean I've been in AI for 25 years, and I would never have imagined it to become this mainstream. And now everybody knows what AI is and what you can do and the business impacts. So I would have not imagined in my wildest dreams when I was just a PhD student building code on a, a singular CPU, a single CPU device. You know, now the, the capabilities we have are simply amazing. And then of course the, the, the transformation of industries and how smaller companies can help. Supply chain, you know, uh, pharma, life sciences, uh, the food and beverage, all these large industries, uh, the opportunities to agriculture, the opportunities to dramatically transform are, uh, are very interesting. So I'm, I'm very excited. I think people who are focused and who are really doing the solving the right problems, we'll see a, a, a major positive impact. But the fact that people who are not doing that will also unfortunately not be able to succeed uh, as uh, the, uh, with the interest rates higher, the cost of capital is higher, uh, you know, you are required to be more focused and value driven than obviously uh, compared to when the capital was more free. And that, that also, requires brutal prioritization and focus. So, you know, that's kind of my uh, predictions for the next two years is continued digital transformation, continued AI transformation. I still believe even though we are in a negative cycle for blockchain technologies, I still believe it's it's a major driver of re-architecture of business models. Uh, and there's a lot more uh, need for more decentralized models compared to the centralized models that we see are failing today and a lot more need for tokenizing physical assets like commodities that will drive a lot of financing uh, and supply chain capabilities as well. And it's in the early stages where I see um, you know, more focused and prioritized uh, efforts on also driving more decentralized technology.